be the God problem is we know this story too well we have to think of it differently yes it's it's basically a fairy tale isn't it it's a, it's a whale of a tale <laughs> We think of it as a fairy tale, just kind of a story that was told in, in Sunday school. And, and it doesn't really apply to our lives, does it really? Come on now, whales. There's no whales in the Mediterranean Sea. Seriously, could this really happen? Did it really happen? Is it true? Could it be? We ask these questions with, with our grown-up rational minds, don't we? Uh, we can think of it, and we just know. We can kinda, it's easy to dismiss because we know it's just, it's just kind of a childhood story that we can dismiss. It's just like uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You know, it's like a fairy tale. But as some of you know, I've been reading a lot about mythology uh, I've been reading many books by a guy named Phil Cousineau, who is a mythologist. I didn't even know the name they had of that, a study of myth. And, and Joseph Campbell, Phil, Phil Cousineau is kind of continuing the work that Joseph Campbell did. Joseph Campbell is the author of, of uh, uh, Hero's Journey. Some of you may know about mythology and the study of it, and, and to which Phil Cousineau says this. If somebody came to him with this story and say, is it true? Did it really happen? Is it true? He would say, oh, no. Oh, absolutely not. It's more than true. See, stories like this, myths, are are more than true. They, They point to a deeper point than the actual story. It's more than true. So it's up to us to to discover what's the truth within this, the deep truth. Cousineau also writes this. Mythology is not just folklore or fairy tale. Myths are poetry. They're metaphorical. Mythology represents the penultimate truth. Penultimate because the ultimate cannot be put into words. It's beyond words. In this sermon series, we're going to be talking about Jonah for several weeks. And and the question is, what is it that's deep in your gut, in your soul, of how this story speaks to you? How are you fleeing from, from something God has called you to do that is special and unique? And it's not just mythologists like Phil Cousineau or Joseph Campbell. It's also scholars and academics. Anybody ever heard of C.S. Lewis? (laughs) C.S. Lewis writes this. Myth is the isthmus which connects the peninsular world of thought with what that vast continent we really belong to. Ignore it and you sever your link with a deeper reality, leaving only barren reason. So in this opening sermon of this this sermon series about Jonah, I ask you to suspend your thoughts right now of what you've heard about in childhood as a fairy tale, this beautiful, cute little story about a man swallowed by a whale. I ask you to suspend your, your academic reasoning knowledge and go deep within you. How does this story speak to you? You see, Jonah is being asked to go pronounce judgment or to go proclaim or to go to preach and and tell them about the love and the faithfulness of God to a godless society of Nineveh. And immediately, I'm sure it doesn't say it in the scripture, but immediately Jonah is saying, what? They don't deserve it? Seriously? You're going to love them? You're going to provide faith to them? You're going to provide hope and comfort to those people who don't deserve it? Seriously? So deep within us, we've got people like that too in our lives. Those damn Democrats, they're messing everything up. Those hard-headed Republicans. You know, today we're like 30 days away from our election, aren't we? And we've already labeled everyone. We've already know who's evil, who's bad. We already know who's driving our country down into the, into the pits. We already know whether we're su- going to support Ukraine or not support Ukraine. We already have all these things figured out, and God shows up and says, love them. Are you serious? 
Those are our enemies. Those people are bad. I've already labeled those people. It's kind of like the Bronco game today. You know, we're playing the Raiders. Everybody knows the Raiders. They're bad, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, we love to point our finger, the Raiders. Ugh. Oh, those darn Raiders. You know, we love to hate someone, don't we? That was Jonah. He knew how to hate. He knew who was right and good and faithful, and he knew who was evil and bad. And God shows up and asks him to provide hope for them. And it's like, I'm not going to have any part of that. He goes the opposite direction. He goes down to the harbor town of Joppa, and he finds a ship that will go as far away as possible, 2,500 miles all the way to a, a Tarshish. Mentions that three times in the scripture, like it was really important. He went to Tarshish. Did he get that? He went all the way to Tarshish. It's southern Spain, right, in today's modern geography. He went all the way from Joppa, 2,500 miles to Tarshish, away from what God was asking him to do. Two phrases I want you to focus on in this, these first 10 verses. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. That's the first phrase. The word of the Lord comes to you and me all the time, even if we're, we're not Sunday schooled, even if we're not religious people. Sometimes, many times, all the time, a word of the Lord shows up deep within us right here in our pit of our soul. You know, Dave, you really ought to do that. You know, Dave, you could really make a difference if you did that. You know, Dave, if you really ought to vote this way, even though you think this way. Deep within us, the word of the Lord comes to us. Jonah is the son of Amittai, so he was connected with the family. I'm assuming Jonah had a mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely had to. I'm assuming, and I know because Scripture tells us he was Hebrew, he had a faith, he had a God that he agreed to with the mariners. He was connected. He knew people. He was part of a system, of a group, and he decides to leave that and isolate himself. The command was go at once. There was an immediacy to this. To that great city, a large, bustling metropolis, so large it would take three days to walk across, much larger than Denver, maybe probably three, four million people. This was a hub of the world at that time. They were known for their wickedness. Their behavior had become displeasing to God. And cry out against it is what Jonah was asked to do, for their wickedness has come up before me. That was the call to preach, to cry, to put a line in the sand, say, this isn't right. There is a more sacred, holistic way to live. Change your ways was the call for Jonah. And Jonah knew what was going to happen next. He guessed it, even though we don't hear it till the end of the story. Doggone it, they were going to change their ways. He didn't want them to experience that grace and mercy and care and love that he knew and experienced. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah, an insight, a holy anger, a sacred solution, a call to action, a deep urge within Jonah, a deep urge within us calls to us all the time. You know those times when you lay your head down on the pillow and and you think about your day and you think about how the week's going and, and you start thinking about the relationships that you're in and all the places where you messed up that relationship or that thing you said that you didn't really mean and you didn't really want to say, but you said it anyway. You know those that I call it pillow time where where you're sitting by yourself in wonder and in meditation. You're like, gosh, why did I do that? It was at that moment the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And do you know what he did? He fled from it. He slept from it. He isolated himself from it. He numbed himself from it. He went as far away as possible as the word of the Lord directed him to do. And we do that also. Like, no way. I'm not doing it. 
You know, there's a person in my family that uh, we used to drive with regularly, and he would drive. Uh, I don't want to say the person's name. is male or female. And, and one time, we're, we're driving to a Bronco game, okay? And all of us, our passengers, were scared to death because he really shouldn't be driving anymore. You know, we should take away dad's life. Oh, I should. I, uh, we, we, should, we should take away his license. We're all scared to death. And here we come. We're watching. We're all kind of tense anyway. And we can see right before us, like, all the traffic stopped. He didn't see it because he was, he was uh, worried about other things. He was distracted. And all of a sudden, he saw, and he put the brakes on and screeched. And then we hit this brand-new, beautiful Mustang. It was a beautiful car. I was really worried about that Mustang. And my dad's first, oh, excuse me, somebody that not, maybe not related to me. The first reaction was, oh, those darn mechanics. Ah, oh, those darn mechanics didn't adjust the brakes correctly. Ah, oh, I hate that when that happens, don't you? No fault of my dad's, what's, uh, no fault of the person I was driving with whatsoever. It's like, no, the blame came. It's easier to blame than to take responsibility. Man, I was distracted. And I'm sorry. Our first reaction always is to blame. Our first reaction is to always do something different than that deep urge within us, which is to take responsibility. Some of you know that I'm gluten-free, or I try to be gluten-free. Some of you know that I've been diagnosed with celiac, so I shouldn't eat any gluten whatsoever. But every now and then, I can't help myself. I'm driving on C-470. There's the Quebec exit. There's the Krispy Kreme. And I'm like, oh, I got it. And my truck just goes over there automatically. I get out because I want to see the donuts, you know, as they're going. I want the full experience. And I order the, one of those hot, warm, gluten, uh, gluten-filled donuts, and they melt in my mouth and it's beautiful and I love it. And then alongside that, because if I'm going to sin, I'm going to sin big, okay? Uh, I get one of those long johns. It's not hot, but it's got the chocolate. It's got the cream inside and I eat that and it's lovely and it's beautiful and it's wonderful. It's the exact opposite of what the doctors and even my wife and my family and God himself has told me to do. I've gone the opposite direction. And I love it. And then I have to pay the price for it. It Takes about 40 minutes. Find a restroom. Work it out. (laughs) Yeah, I don't want to get too detailed here. (laughs) There is this holy urge within each one of us. This holy passion. This idea coming to us that that says, you know, you really ought to do that. Each one of us. And when we don't follow that, there are terrible consequences that happen. Of course, there was a storm. Of course, all the people around Jonah's life at that time, which were all those mariners, all his shipmates, of course, it disrupted all of that whole system. Whatever they had on board their cargo, which is the reason they were all on board anyway, to take it from here to there and to make money, they threw all the cargo over. When we don't follow this deep urge within us that we know we're supposed to do, it disrupts everyone and everything. Just because we go the opposite direction of what God's called us to do. And so then the next question, this, my other phrase that I really dialed in on, the first one was a word of the Lord came to Jonah. The second one comes at the end. All the mariners come together. It's like, why are you asleep in, in the boat? Why are you isolated? Why aren't you helping out? And they discover he's the reason why there's so much disruption in the system. And they say, what did you do? What did you do? And Jonah himself, I'm sure, has to ask the question, what did I do? When we disrupt 
all the people's lives around us and within us because of our words, because of our actions, because of our comments that that aren't grace-giving, that aren't loving, that aren't caring. When we disrupt everyone around us deep, when we have our pillow time, we have to ask the question ourselves, what did I do? You know, some of you know my story. I was a pastor, a new church development pastor in Parker, Colorado. I started this church. It's a lovely church. It's a beautiful church. I'm proud of myself for doing that. It's it's one of the first churches that was developed in over over 20 years in our presbytery. It's a great church. I started that, and and it was beautiful. And and then somewhere along the way, about year 12, year 13, year 14, year 15, it, it became all about institutional management, I'm not gifted like Justin is. He knows, he loves this stuff, institutional management. He loves it. He's like, oh, bring it on. Yes, I can organize it. I can see all of it. I love to do this, attend to this problem, attend to this issue, attend to this conflict. Yeah, he's good at that. But me, no, I like starting new things. I like using my personality. I like doing pastoral care. I got so tired of ministry, and I became so sarcastic. I said, I I can't do this anymore. I'm done. A calling I've had since third grade. I said, I'm done. At that same time, a friend of mine came and said, hey, I'll hire you. I'll hire you to be a communications expert in a, in a communications company. It's like, I don't know anything about that. I, he said, either do I. But I'm supposed to find 12 people to hire to do this uh, communications thing. It's like, okay. And so I left. I left ministry. I left the church. I became an uh, account manager. I had a, a desk uh, assigned to me. You see me at a desk? 12 hours a day, eight hours a day. I loved it because I was gone. I was outside of the church. It's like, oh, this is the first time I've had a job actually outside of the church. Look at me. And then I was laid off three months later. And then I had to ask the question, what did I do? What did I do? Why did I do that? Who am I? I've disrupted the financial stability of our whole family. I violated this call that God called me to since third grade. What did I do? And around that time, Justin didn't know any of this was going on in my head, my mind, and spirit, but he approaches me and says, hey, would, would you ever consider, like we're looking for an associate pastor just temporarily. We're trying to figure some things out of grace. Would you ever consider just kind of temporarily being an associate pastor? Oh my gosh, there's my light. There's God relentlessly pursuing me. There's God saying to me, you have gifts that I want to use and still I want you to use that. I tell that story because it's the same story of Jonah. It's the same story you and I all have. You have a gift. You have an ability You affect people around you. You're not God. You don't know what God knows. You can't offer that faithfulness that God has faithfulness about and in. The Ninevites are evil people. Yes, do they deserve God's love? No. But Jonah, I'm asking you to do that. There's a holy urge. There's a holy passion deep within each one of us. And when we, that holy passion is like, hey, I'm calling on you to be a good father. I'm calling on you to be this amazing husband or wife or spouse or partner or friend. I'm calling on you to to be that amazing grandparent for your grandchildren. I'm calling on you to to help out your neighbor. I'm calling on you to to send money to uh, this terrible storm that happened in in the southeast part of our country. I'm calling on you to send money to Ukraine or to rally against not sending money to Ukraine. Whatever it is, that deep passion within you, I'm calling on you. And when you don't follow God's call, whatever that is for you, you have to be left with the question, 
sometime later. What did I do? I so want to wrap this story up with, with the good news of God's grace and mercy, but it's going to come weeks later from here. Right now, just sit with that question. What did you do? What urge, what holy passion have you and are you fleeing from? Amen? Amen.